Adam Gopnik has appeared many times over the years. Given the range of topics that he masters in his numerous books and reviews, I'm always happy to extend an invitation. The lives and ideas of Lincoln and Darwin, who to thunk? The interplay between restaurants and cafe society in France, too, please. A discussion of the mind-body problem with Daniel Dennett, a no-brainer. And on and on and, we hope, on. Tonight, the three-time recipient of the National Magazine Award and a winner of the George Polk Award for Magazine Reporting offers answers to dogmatic attacks on liberalism and its adherence in his new book, A Thousand Small Sanities, a witty manifesto about the great historical moral success of this philosophy and its necessity and challenges in an age of awful autocracy. What a pleasure to have him return. Please welcome Adam Gopnik to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you, and, and thank you all for coming. This is always a, um, a visit that for me has enormous meaning and significance, in part because of the, the heritage and the legacy of the Free Library of Philadelphia. I don't think there are more beautiful words in any language than free library. It's, they're among the most beautiful words ever made. They sum up a lot of what I want to talk to you about tonight, about the nature of liberal civilization and the invention of liberal institutions. But I also always love coming here because here is home. Philadelphia is where I was born and lived until I was 12 years old and a place to which I still have an enormous emotional and spiritual and geographic and gastronomic <laughs> attachment. I want to talk to you tonight about the, the content of my new book, but I want to do it in a slightly unusual way. I don't want to read to you from the book, and nor do I want to give you a, a lecture as such uh, about its ideas. No, I want, if I can, to take you on a kind of walk with me, a kind of uh, tour with me, uh, as I think about and let you visit a few remarkable people in my company, and even more important, in the imaginary company of my daughter, Olivia. Because it was Olivia's distress that began all of this. On the night of the last election in 2016, uh, Olivia, my daughter, who was then 17, was stressed, traumatized, fragmented, freaked out, as she said. The gentleman here agrees with her, and, we, and many of us did. It wasn't that she was upset at the surprising and even shocking ascension of a new political party to power that might not have been the one her parents voted for. Certainly, if that had been her objection, I would have had no sympathy with it. The oscillation of parties in power is part of the natural and necessary life of any liberal democracy. No, what frightened her and freaked her out was the sudden specter of a new kind of authoritarianism coming into power, the sudden specter of personalities and ideologies that seem to be directly opposed to the liberal democratic and liberal humanist values that she had been raised with. An authoritarianism not only ugly in many of its faces, but predatory in many of its actions. So seeing how distressed she was, I said to her, darling, let's just go out and we'll take a walk together. We'll talk this out. So we stepped out onto the street at 1 a.m., and for the next two hours, we walked around our Manhattan neighborhood, my arm around hers, hers around me. She's taller than I am. Um, <laughs> and I tried to instill in her, I tried to fill her with a certain kind of faith. I tried to instill in her the basis, the fundamentals, the premises of the worldview that I think of as liberal and humane, the worldview that I believe beginning in this very city 250 years ago gave birth to this remarkable spiritual movement we call liberal democracy and liberal institutions. I told her about how nothing could really interfere with that evolution, no one bad politician or one bad man. I gave her lots of historical examples to pay attention to. I showed her how the dry and abstract propositions uh, that she had been learning in school uh, were of a special urgency on this night of all nights. She paid me absolutely no attention at all as I spoke. What 17-year-old girl would pay attention to her father at that moment? And partly because I was speaking in the wrong spirit. I was speaking abstractly. I was speaking as a speaker rather than as a living witness. 
And I noticed that she turned, as every 17-year-old girl will turn sooner or later, back to her phone, <laughs> where the OMFGs of all of her circle of friends were far more persuasive and in their way far more reassuring than anything I could say. But my failure stayed with me for the next two years. And deep inside me, I had an urge, a desire, a necessity to go out and write Olivia a letter on liberalism. Write Olivia the lecture that I had failed to deliver on that night, exactly because I had tried to make it into a lecture instead of into a living letter of love from father to daughter. So I began to imagine, I began to imagine taking Olivia on a kind of ride, on a kind of tour of, not of principles in the abstract, but of people who had lived those principles in ways that I found moving. I sort of began to imagine a kind of um, liberal Pirates of the Caribbean ride that I would take her on. We would go around together and stop and look at the significant piratic figures. Only these were not pirates, these were optimists and makers. And I began to assemble in my mind what such a ride might look like and whom we might visit on the way. And in Olivia's company, I knew that I would be in the presence of someone who would never passively accept any account I gave her, but would always be pressing me, as our wise children must, to clarify my thoughts and to augment my personalities. The first people I wanted her to see on this ride, on this journey that I wanted her to go with me, on, uh, with me imaginatively, were a remarkable couple, an English couple, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor. Now, many of you may remember from high school or college the name of John Stuart Mill. He is, by consensus, the greatest liberal philosopher known by that name who has ever lived. It was John Stuart Mill who wrote what is still the most famous book, the foundational book, as much as Darwin's On the Origin of Species is the foundational book of evolutionary biology. Mill's great book On Liberty, which came out in exactly the same publishing season, as Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Imagine being the publisher to have those two books <laughs> on your list in one season. On Liberty came out at that same time, and it's foundational to what we mean by liberalism and the vision of liberalism. But I wasn't thinking of John Stuart Mill in isolation or as some kind of icon of liberal thought. No, I was thinking of him in his loving relation to the woman he thought of as his partner, eventually his wife, and certainly as the greatest teacher he had ever had. Her name was Harriet Taylor. She was young, and she was beautiful, and she had made a bad marriage early in life and had a few children, and then she had met Mill at a dinner party, and they had had one of those moments that the French call them coup de foudre, a lightning bolt, when they realized that each of them was the necessary partner that they had been waiting for their entire lives. And yet, because they were deeply good people, they didn't want simply to overturn the apple cart of ordinary life. She had obligations to her husband, to her children. Mill had obligations to their shared principles and to her. So they began courting clandestinely. They began arranging to meet uh, in unexpected places. And one of their favorite places to meet and talk and stare into each other's eyes and perhaps canoodle a bit was at a bench at the London Zoo where they would meet outside the rhinoceros cage at the London Zoo. Now, the rhinoceros had arrived at the London Zoo relatively recently, 1826, and Mill and Taylor would visit it in the early 1830s. And they had made the very good and intelligent philosophical deduction that the great thing about courting in front of a rhinoceros cage is that everyone looks at the rhinoceros. <laughs> no one looks at the adulterous couple on the other side of the rhinoceros. And while they were there, John and Harriet would have long and passionate conversations. They would collaborate. Within a year, Mill, one of the most famous writers in England, would write a review of a book by Lord Byron, and a friend would say, well, who really wrote that, you or Harriet Taylor? And they began to talk, and they began to dream. And they began to think about how the world that they lived in could be made a richer, a better, a fairer place. Mill shared with her all of the ideas on the necessity of freedom of expression that would eventually become that great book on liberty. The idea that we should be impeded in no way whatever from expressing our views, however difficult, however challenging, however blasphemous they might seem. The view that 
no idea is unworthy of being examined. The idea that all speech should be open and that there's no idea so sacred or divine that it can't stand the close scrutiny of a hostile investigation. Crucial idea, not for freedom of speech constrained, not for freedom of expression within limits, but as absolute a right to debate. Fundamental liberal value, even more than freedom of speech, freedom of debate enshrined for all time, eloquently and permanently in that book. But at the same time that they were discussing the ideas of liberty and freedom and individual rights to expression, uh, Harriet Taylor was sharing with John the ideas uh, about women's emancipation that would eventually take flight in a still more eloquent book, their joint book on the subjection of women, which would be published much later, but whose lifeblood began then. And Harriet Taylor shared with John Stuart Mill, she woke him, made him a woke man, shared with him her understanding, her perception that being a married woman in Victorian England was to naturally and inevitably be oppressed. She had had to hand over her name, her legal rights, in many respects her very existence to a man who she knew, John Taylor, who a man who she knew was her intellectual inferior. And the thought that this was taken for granted, that women's role in the world should forever and eternally be seconded to men seemed to her intolerable. The idea that a woman, every woman, would be the serf of some petty tyrant at the breakfast table seemed to her unimaginable. And they began to think and began to write in front of that rhinoceros cage about the idea of ending the subjugation of women, ending the oppression of women. Not making modest changes, not saying women should be listened to more, not some educated women should have the vote, not perhaps we can imagine one or two women doctors someplace out in the future. No, they made the demand and they had the vision of absolute equality in all forms of social life between the sexes, an idea we're still pursuing and still trying to achieve. They had that vision at a time when it was regarded as the quixotic outer fringe of human imagination, the idea of an absolute equality in social roles and in economic opportunities and in political rights between men and women. Now, if you stop to think about the minds that made those two books, you'll see what I mean by the moral adventure of liberalism. That's the subtitle of my book, A Thousand Small Sanities, The Moral Adventure of Liberalism. What do I mean by that? Well, think about those two books that John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor were imagining in that zoo in London in the 1830s. One book on liberty is a claim and a demand for absolute freedom of the individual to express ourselves, to speak our view, to fulfill ourselves as people according to our own desires and demands, not according to those that any authoritarian hierarchy imposes on us. An absolute statement for liberty. But the other book that they were writing on the subjection of women was a claim about social equality. It was a claim that the instruments of government had to be used to remove all of the impediments that kept women from having a full social role, and that social equality was every bit as important as individual liberty. Now, if you think about it, we, in some ways, take that for granted. That's what liberalism is. It's the belief that those two things, a desire for individual freedom and a desire for social equality, can go hand in hand, but that's a powerful, many respects, a new idea, and it's the heart, the DNA of the liberal vision that I'm advocating in this book, and that I wanted to share with Olivia on this wild ride that we would go on. Some people will tell you that it's a contradiction, I said to Olivia. Some people will tell you that the desire for the individual to be free to express himself or herself freely will always be at war with the demand that we bring more and greater freedom to more and more kinds and types of human beings. But it's the heart of what John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor imagined in front of that rhinoceros cage, that those two things are not contradictory, that those two things are not intention, or if they're intention, they're only in a kind of fruitful and meaningful tension. That that's exactly the liberal dream, the liberal vision. Just as a, we don't say a tightrope walker, is a contradiction because he's trying to walk forward on the tightrope while keeping his balance on it. No, we say that's the job of the tightrope walker. That's what tightrope walking is. In the same way, that's what 
the liberal ambition is. That's the moral adventure of liberalism, to bring greater equality to the world and to bring individual freedom, to see that if individual freedom is not widely shared by as many people as possible, then none of us can share it. It's Bruce Springsteen's great sign offline, nobody wins unless everybody wins, made into a philosophical position and an ideological belief. So those were the first people I wanted Olivia to see, and I wanted her to see them in front of the rhinoceros cage particularly, because it occurred to me as I was thinking about them, visualizing them, imagining them, touching hands and sharing ideas there, that the rhinoceros in a way was a perfect symbol of the liberalism that they helped to bring into the world. Uh, a rhinoceros is not a pretty animal. A rhinoceros is not an inspiring animal. In fact, it's so much not so that when the first explorers and travelers went out to look at animals in the world and they saw the rhinoceros, they came home and they lied about it. They said there's this great animal and it's beautifully white, has a long mane and a long silver horn in the middle of its forehead. Because a unicorn is just a rhinoceros with a PR person. A unicorn <laughs> is just a rhinoceros that's been falsely reported by a visitor. And as a consequence, all we talk about are unicorns. You can go into any store and buy pictures of unicorns. Medieval tapestries are full of a hunt for a unicorn. The unicorn has only one flaw. It does not exist. <laughs> the rhinoceros has one great and overriding virtue. It does. And it's a formidable animal that can run over an SUV, go on YouTube and watch. The rhinoceros that John and Harriet were looking at, I realized, and I wanted to share with Olivia, is the perfect heraldic animal of liberalism. Squat, ungainly, unappealing, slow moving, but formidable. They were the first people I wanted Olivia to meet and to look at, but I wanted her to go back a little farther in time too. I was thinking about showing her, taking her to the deathbed of the great Scottish philosopher David Hume in Edinburgh in that auspicious year of 1776, because at Hume's deathbed, he had only one companion, the equally great Scottish economist, Adam Smith. And Smith stayed with Hume through the horrible weeks and months of his dying, the way some of us sometimes now stay with a friend in chemo, um, keep them company, keep them entertained, talk to them all the time. Now, Hume's dying was something that everyone in England was talking about, everyone in England and Scotland, was talking about because Hume was a confessed free thinker and everyone was sure that he would repent and turn to the church on his deathbed. He didn't. He refused to. But he and Smith talked about the ideas that they had tried to create together and about one idea more than any other. And that is the idea that human societies can be organized not around a principle of hierarchical authority, not by power flowing downward from a ruler below. No, that it could be connected, it could be created, human government, simply through the power of human sympathy, through the power of social sympathy. That is our instinct, which they saw as natural to human beings, to come to the aid, to empathize with the sufferings, to care compassionately about the problems of another human being. I was talking about these things the other night in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and just as I came to this part in my tour with Olivia, just as I was taking her to Hume's deathbed with Adam Smith. A man died in the front row. Um, I don't think he actually died, but he had a severe seizure. And what happened was that everybody else in the front row, maybe one of you wants to volunteer so we can see this happen again, everyone else in the front two rows raced to this man, total stranger to them, to help him, to assist him, to get him to an ambulance. They didn't know who he was, but immediately they recognized that he was in distress and they had the immediate instinct of social sympathy, which our society encourages. Our society says that's the right thing to do. Don't ask what clan does he belong to. Don't ask what's his family background. Don't ask what's his religion. Go to his aid. That spirit of social sympathy, which we see manifested around us all the time, was, David Hume believed, the core, the foundation of a liberal society, of a new kind of society. And Adam Smith absorbed that idea. Now, some of you may have heard, you probably have, of Adam Smith as the great master and apostle of the free market. And he was, he was. He believed in free trade, invented the idea of free trade in some ways, or invented the first defense of free trade, I should say. But he also believed just as powerfully in the idea of simple human social sympathy as the mucilage of free societies. 
uh, and before he wrote his famous book on the wealth of nations, he wrote another, in ways, even better book called On the Moral Sentiments. And he believed that if we didn't have those moral sentiments, if we didn't have a practice and a uh, teaching, a belief in compassion and social sympathy as the foundation of everything that we did as social animals, then we could never have truly free markets, then we could never share in truly free trade. He understood that we had to have sympathetic social institutions first and then free markets afterwards, a truth that's demonstrated every day in countries like Russia where the absence of those social institutions makes a mockery of the practice of free market capitalism. Smith understood that, Hume understood that, and Hume never turned away from his belief in the power, the connective power of social sympathy even as he lay dying. He never turned to heaven for recourse, he turned to other human beings and to his best friend. I wanted Olivia to see these two staid and taciturn Scottish men on that deathbed to see what it meant to have a sympathetic view of human behavior. But then Olivia would say to me in my imagination, you know, Dad, those are kind of the easy people to praise. Those are people from the distant past. Those are people who aren't facing anything like the same kinds of problems that I'm facing now. Um, the problems of racial discrimination, the problem of white supremacy, the problems of uh, profound unfairness, the problems of American oppression and persecution. So the next person on this trip that I wanted her badly to meet was the man who I think of as the greatest American who ever lived, and that's Frederick Douglass. Great abolitionist, ex-slave, amazing writer, greatest orator America has ever seen. And what makes Douglass so endlessly fascinating and what makes him such a powerful example is that he's proof of the idea that it's possible to have absolutely radical ideas and believe in radical transformations and still have a profoundly liberal temperament. Douglass was, as you can imagine, completely uncompromising on the question of slavery. How could he not be? He had suffered and almost died as a slave. But at a crucial moment in his life, in the late 1850s, uh, he had to choose, in effect, between following John Brown on the path of, what, of violence and raiding of the South and aligning with the newly formed Republican Party, uh, the party of Abraham Lincoln, at that time, and follow the path, the torturous and the painful path of trying to build a coalition large enough and broad enough, a political coalition that could actually form an army to defeat slavery, not just engage in heroic and romantic action against it. And close as he was to John Brown, he chose the path of politics. He chose the path of politics and never abandoned it, even when he was hugely frustrated throughout the Civil War by Lincoln's temporizing which he finally came to understand was a reflection of the necessity that Abraham Lincoln felt to build a coalition of very unlike peoples that would stick together, hold together long enough to win an impossibly difficult war. And in one of the greatest moments, excuse me, in American history, on the night of Lincoln's second inaugural, when finally this war had been won, and where Lincoln had come to embrace all of Douglas's values, and L Douglas had come to embrace all of Lincoln's tactical skill, um, Douglas was the first man Lincoln sought out. And he said, there is my friend. Not there is Mr. Douglas, but there is my friend. Uh, and it was exactly because Lincoln went on immediately after to speak for black enfranchisement that John Wilkes Booth heard him and said, I must put him over, i.e., I must kill him. Frederick Douglass, an amazing figure who stands before us to this day as the greatest American because he combines the roles both of radical prophet and of liberal politician. I wanted Olivia to see him, to imagine him, to understand him. But I also wanted her to, on this great liberal ride I wanted to take her on, I wanted her to meet people who weren't necessarily politicians or political philosophers or political actors of any kind. I wanted her to meet the great writers, novelists, and painters who have contributed so much to the liberal imagination, who have made the liberal imagination a shining thing. I wanted her to meet, for instance, another British couple from a, a later period in London life, a couple called the Lewises, George and Marion Lewis. Now, we don't often stop to think, some of you are stopping to say, the Lewises? Who are the Lewises? Well, we don't often think about the Lewises because the man of the couple, George Henry Lewis, isn't a familiar name to us, and the woman 
His wife is known to us by another name. She's known to us as the greatest English novelist, George Eliot. She took the name George Eliot in tribute to her husband. Well, I say husband and wife, they were never married. John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor were audacious enough to court and collaborate by the rhino's cage. In the 1850s, George Henry Lewis and Marian Evans, who became, took the pen name of George Eliot, actually never got married for complicated reasons involving his first marriage and presented themselves as a married couple to all of London. They simply declared themselves married and when her very staid religious brother said, well, who performed the ceremony? She said, I did not say someone performed the ceremony. I said, we are now Mr. and Mrs. Lewis. <laughs> now, I wanted her to meet them because, uh, Olivia, to meet them and see them because they represented a kind of liberalism, what I like to think of not so much as the liberalism of principle as a liberalism of process. What do I mean by that? What can I mean by that? Well, George Henry Lewis, the man of this couple, was one of the most fascinating men of the 19th century. If you ever have a chance to read him or find out about him, do. He was an actor in the first instance. Though not Jewish himself, he decided that he would put on the very first production of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, in which Shylock would be the hero instead of the villain. <laughs> uh, prescient man, visionary man, great theater critic. The theater was his passion, his total passion. He's the best theater critic in English between uh, Hazlitt and George Bernard Shaw. Theater was his passion, but he met Marianne Evans and he stopped in his tracks and said, this woman is so much greater an artist than I can ever be. I want to devote my life to supporting her and encouraging her and making sure that she can harvest this extraordinary talent of which she herself is hardly aware of its extent and of its importance. So he retreated from the stage and became a writer on science and a speculator on science. And in the course of his scientific writings, he coined a phrase and discovered a principle that remains vital and crucial to the whole liberal vision, and that's the idea of emergence. You've heard of that idea, I'm sure, I'm sure people talking about emergent systems or emergent states. And what they mean by it simply, and this was Lewis's realization, is that the elements of a system can sometimes, in fact almost invariably, organize themselves into another system that is totally different from the elements that make it up. Lewis's favorite demonstration of this principle is the most obvious one, water. Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, but water as a physical body, as a, as a thing in the world, is completely different, has, follows completely different rules and laws, has completely different potentials, completely different purposes in practice than the things that make it up. And Lewis saw that you could apply this insight that new systems could emerge from very unlikely parts to the entirety of the, of the physical sciences and indeed to the human sciences and even to political science that the fascinating thing about watching any system was to see that very unlikely parts could assemble themselves into very remarkable structures. It was the heart of Darwin's idea as well, and Darwin was a close friend of the Lewis's. The idea that enormous change could happen, not through will and design, but through the slow, incremental uh, accumulation of modifications and changes under stress. And what's so beautiful about this liberalism of process is that it was both practical and artistic. In the hands of George Henry Lewis, it became immensely practical because Lewis and his friends and his group of liberal thinkers and liberal reformers made one of their primary objects of reform the London sewer system because they recognized that sewage was collecting all the time in the Thames River and that it was responsible for what they called a miasma, now, they didn't understand the germ theory of disease. They didn't understand what caused typhoid and cholera, but they recognized that there was a causal connection between raw sewage in the streets and cholera in the slums. And they went about building the first great sewer in Europe, one of the first great sewers, and it's absolutely fascinating correspondence because they would go to Brussels to look at the sewers in Brussels, and then they would go to Paris. They devoted themselves to the questions of sewers because they understood through that kind of public work, which could only be achieved by a government under pressure from liberal reformers, lives could be saved. The sewer was built, the great cholera epidemics, the big stink, as they called it, in London of the 19th century were eased and then eliminated. Literally, millions of lives directly and by emulation were saved through that reforming liberalism of process, which we can replicate 
in every Western city, and among every Western circle. So it had a practical effect, this liberalism of process, but it also had a beautiful artistic effect because it's very much at the core of George Eliot's moral vision of human beings and society. If you read that greatest of English novels, in my view, Middlemarch, go back and read it. You'll enjoy it more if you're reading it later in life than you did the first time you read it in your 20s, and if you're in your 20s and you haven't read it yet, read it now. It's a study, exactly, of the power of emergence in human lives, how the crucial things that happen to us, the crucial ways we change, aren't by declaration, aren't by a sudden dramatic or melodramatic transformation, as Dickens so beautifully and poetically uh, uh, presented us in something like A Christmas Carol, where Scrooge is transformed overnight by his vision, a wonderful moral vision, but a fable of a kind, a beautiful fairy tale. In George Eliot's realist view of the world, people change slowly and over time, and yet in the course of half a lifetime, Dorothea, the heroine of Middlemarch, goes from being an oppressed woman to a misunderstood woman to a wife to a free woman at the end by exactly that same process of slow and incremental self-understanding and transformation. So that I wanted Olivia to understand this extraordinary couple whose great work was done not directly in the political sphere, not directly by writing political tracts, but by understanding the power of the liberal imagination to remake things as unlike as sewers and novels. There were more people, though, that I wanted Olivia to meet. But Olivia, at this point in our imaginary night journey through it, uh, raised the, the right objection. She said, Dad, I understand why you love all of these people. These are amazing people. But they all belong to the past. They all belong to a past that may be inspiring, but isn't strictly relevant to the world we're living in now and to the challenges that I began to face on that November night in New York in 2016. And I said to her, that's true, darling, but you know what? Those very principles, the principles that Taylor and Mill proposed, the processes that Lewis and uh, Eliot encapsulated, the struggle, the political struggles that Frederick Douglass chose in place of mere violence, of empty violence, uh, they are so much part of our life now. And I pointed her towards a transformation in my own adopted city of New York uh, that exemplified all of this. And that is the great crime decline of the last 30 years. It's been true in Philadelphia as well, of course. It's been one of the single most extraordinary social transformations of the later part the latter part of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st, and we don't talk about it very much. We don't talk about it sufficiently. When I first moved to New York in 1979, uh, violent crime was a dominant feature of daily life. It was one of the things we talked about, we uh, warded ourselves off from, we struggled to understand. And it was taken for granted that this urban crisis was permanent and unresolvable, that if we were ever to fix it, we would have to go down deep and entirely change the social structure of poor families, or we would have to have a new kind of authority, and we tried all kinds of fixes, and it seemed permanent. And then it began to change. It began to change so much that in New York now, there's a much lower level of violence than there was a century ago. It's an astonishing change, and this so often happens in human life. We pay more attention to the bad news than to the good news, and we don't stop to analyze it sufficiently. But I said to Olivia, you know, if you try and understand what made this happen, what caused this extraordinary crime decline, it wasn't some vast immediate social change. No, the sociologists who have studied it most closely say it was exactly a thousand small sanities working together, smarter community policing, money spent on community action, the presence of increasing eyes on the street, the creation of virtuous circles of social encouragement, the more people who are on the subway late at night, the more people come onto the subway late at night. The more people who come into the subway late at night, the more people there are on the street. The more people there are on the street, the more inviting the street becomes. On and on in that way, we can make the practice of crime increasingly uninviting. We don't have to build a 20-foot wall. We just have to build a series of three-feet walls that make uh, the bad business of crime, and it is a bad business to be in, uh, less and less enticing and inviting. Exactly that same liberalism of process, that faith that 
new systems and new and healthier, more salubrious systems can emerge without our being able to cure the underlying or change necessarily all of the underlying causes. That if we began simply to apply common sense and sanity to the immediate problem at hand, we could make a fundamental and foundational change. That's what Lewis and Eliot understood, and that was still true today. As much as true as it had been about making London safe from cholera, it was true about making New York safe for all of us, uh, the poor among us especially, uh, safe from crime. Same principle, same liberal vision, same liberal imagination. And I went on to point out to her how much we had learned about what makes liberal democracy work in the last 30 years, which chimed in, which reaffirmed the same underlying principles. I pointed out to her the work of the great Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam, who studied the question of what it was that made democracy work in Italy. Why was it that local democracy would work in one part of Italy and not in another part? And he said it was because there were already existing social institutions, already existing social capital, exactly the same thing that Smith and Hume had envisioned and understood intuitively and intellectually on that deathbed, he was able to demonstrate in practice. If people were accustomed to singing in amateur opera groups, there was a chance that local democracy would take. If they're all of their experience of the social world depended on, their, on clan and blood, then democracy would not take. If we have the habit of being in communion with our fellow citizens on subjects and in processes and in meetings that have nothing to do with politics, then there's a chance that democratic politics can take. One of my other liberal heroes, who was easy to take Olivia to visit, because his spirit haunts a place right around the corner, Central Park, is Frederick Law Olmsted, the great art landscape designer, who was, as not enough people know, before he designed an inch of landscape, a great reporter, great reporter for the New York Times. And he went to the south of the United States in that same momentous decade of the 1850s, and he brooded on what it was that made the north a more vibrant place, a more powerful place, and he said it's the power of what he called commonplace civilization. It was all of the ways in which a free society enables people to come together in intermediate institutions, in social institutions, from coffee houses to volunteer fire departments, and begin the necessary and difficult practice of common conversation with people unlike ourselves that was, Olmsted saw the real spine and strength of democracy, and Central Park is a great monument to that vision, a place designed for generation after generation of fundamentally different kinds, immigrants and locals, to come and each find ways of having organized or disorganized pleasure as they choose according to the demands of their time and generation. So all of the things that I had been talking about, I wanted Olivia to understand, were living examples, living truths about the world that she could see around her. But I didn't want to leave her simply with the idea of a kind of triumphalist liberal democratic set of values. God knows we're living through a time when those values and the liberal imagination itself is under a kind of assault that it has not been under in at least 70 years and maybe in several hundred. So I wanted her to pay attention to the, to the criticisms, the great critics, the great attacks on liberalism as they had, had emerged. I wanted her to stop and look and think about the great conservative critics of liberalism who've pointed out again and again that the vision that I'm praising often leaves people feeling uprooted. Liberalism takes the side of progress. It takes the side of change. And change is difficult for people. Change is traumatic. Change often means overthrowing uh, traditional structures and losing traditional places. This isn't something that we condescend to. This isn't something that we patronize, this distaste for change. I feel it every time I come back here to my hometown of Philadelphia, and I witness small transformations, and I resist them. I don't want the city to change. I don't want not to feel connected to the place where I was born and where all of my early memories reside, the place that I still see in my nighttime dreams. That human appetite for commonality, for communion, for tradition, is a very profound one. And the great conservatives, critics of liberalism, I would say to Olivia, have pointed out again and again that liberalism asks too often, what do I want? And not often enough, 
Where do I stand? Where am I in relation to other people and other communities? How do I extend a sense of organic community, of living community, out into the modern world? It's a powerful question and one that we need to have rational answers for. And then, of course, I wanted her to be aware of all the great left-wing critics of liberalism, too, who, if the conservatives criticize liberalism's over-dependence on reason, the left-wing ones criticize liberalism's over-dependence on reform, saying that incremental change is often not enough, that what we need is radical change, revolutionary change, to make the world a more just and equitable place. And I wanted her to meet those people, but I wanted her to meet, too, the people who I think of as among the greatest heroes, the people I think of as the radicals of the real. So one of the last people I wanted her to meet on this journey was someone who was still alive in New York when I was already up and riding, and that is the great black activist Bayard Rustin. Not a name enough people conjure with anymore, but I wanted her to see Rustin because Rustin was a truly heroic, liberal figure. Rustin was the man, both gay and black, uh, he was arrested 24 times for being black and once for being gay, um, 24 times for being a civil rights activist and once as a homosexual, uh, who was excommunicated from the civil rights movement uh, exactly because at that time in the early 1960s, uh, the civil rights movement didn't know what to make of gay men, didn't know what to do about the homosexuals. It wasn't something that was at the forefront of their attention and they excommunicated Rustin and then realized that he was absolutely essential to the business of building the structure that would enable the March on Washington to take place. And they called Rustin back in. Rustin said mischievously at one point that Dr. King, who he revered and adored as a saint, said Dr. King is a saint, but he couldn't organize vampires to go to a bloodbath. <laughs> and Rustin could. That was his genius, was as an organizer. And he began the impossibly difficult piece-by-piece piece work of actually making the March on Washington happen. Chartering the buses, seeing how you got everybody into Washington on a Friday, how they got home on a Sunday, making sure that there were enough sandwiches for everybody to go around, building a whole complicated process, a whole frame in which Dr. King's great speech could ring out. And Rustin never abandoned those principles of liberal activism despite all the discouragement and disillusion that he endured in his lifetime. And he once defined, at the end, towards the end of his life, his credo, his belief in three simple terms. Constitutional means, democratic measures, nonviolent acts. And there, in three simple phrases, are the vital and crucial dance steps of liberalism. Constitutional means, democratic measures, nonviolent acts. And they can change the world, as he showed. I wanted Olivia to know all of those people, and yet I knew that Olivia would still come back to me with doubt. That's a fine story you've told, Dad. It's a wonderful ride to be on. But will it be enough? Can those examples and those principles, those dance steps ever be enough to repel, to conquer at this moment of emergency, the shadow of autocracy, the specter of authoritarianism that I felt on that night in November? And I shared her fears. I share them tonight. Someone once said, I think it was me, <laughs> that the only true philosophy that we know is the philosophy of our insomnia. It isn't the things we say at noon in a classroom that matter. It's the things that we fear at 3 a.m. that show where we really live and how we really feel and think. And at 3 a.m. every morning, I wake up and I fear the dissolution of this extraordinary, flawed, imperfect, rhinoceros of a country and rhinoceros of a world that we've struggled to create through all of those heroic people and heroic acts. A world and a set of countries and institutions that with all of their countless flaws have managed to make uh, lands more prosperous and certainly more plural than any that human beings have been able to enjoy before. They're endangered. They have a very hard time defending themselves. I did a speech once on the occasion of the Metropolitan Museum's great show called Jerusalem 1000. And it's haunted me ever since, that show and that moment, that talk I gave. Because what that show demonstrated was that in the great city of Jerusalem in the year 1000, 
very different, radically different people managed to coexist, Jews and Muslims uh, and Christians, all on the whole managed to trade and barter and live with each other. They coexisted rather well. There are uh, Christian manuscripts that seem to have been illuminated by Muslim uh, artists. There are beakers, glass beakers, that seem is where it's uncertain if they were made as Muslim ware to sell to Jews or as European ware brought back to the Middle East. It's a, a kind of beautifully hybrid back and forth going on between very opposed and unlike communities. But by the end of that century, of course, that entire practice of coexistence had vanished in competitive massacre and counter massacre. All that liberalism tries to do is to make that human practice of sympathy and compassion, that human practice of practical coexistence into a principle of pluralism. That's what I mean when I say that liberalism at its best is not an ideology, uh, a political ideology applied to the world or to life. It's what we know about life applied to politics. It's that natural human practice of compassion and coexistence turned into a set of permanent measures into principles of pluralism. And the truth that John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor glimpsed, that every time we expand our freedom, we expand our sense of responsibility to others to extend freedom to them too, and that every time we extend the range and the span of human equality, we enrich our own sense of freedom, that humanism and liberalism are one, that's not even a walk you take with your daughter. That's just two steps. Thank you very much. What's your daughter's college major? Do you really want to know? <laughs> Politics and government. <laughs> She's majoring in government, and she hopes to go on and, and practice politics uh, herself. She may get waylaid, I fear, by English literature. Um, but right now, her purpose is to, she's majoring in, uh, in government, they call it at her school, and that's her purpose right now. I want to challenge your uh, Frederick Dulles as the greatest American. I would suggest George Washington, but I'm also curious, uh, am I correct that Frederick Douglass harbored anti-Semitic uh, points of view? Uh, I, Frederick Douglass was a flawed human being. He was not quite as flawed as that very great man, George Washington, who <laughs> kept slaves. And one of, the, one of the darkest chapters in American history is George Washington, who was uh, Genuine is a hero. He should be remembered as a hero. He took on the losing side that everyone thought would be the losing side and turned it into the winning side. And he's a great figure in the evolution of democracy and of liberal democratic principles. But he's a flawed human being, like all of us, and that flawed human being held slaves and kept slaves. I don't know if any of you have seen or listened to that great American musical, Hamilton, uh, but one of the flaws in that great and inspiring piece is that the Battle of Yorktown is the climax enacted by, uh, large, by a minority caste. And at the Battle of Yorktown, many of slaves had taken refuge behind the British lines, and they were returned to their masters, including Washington and Jefferson. That doesn't make them bad men. It makes it a complicated situation. Douglas um, had many flaws as well. His largest flaw, I think, was that he had a hard time understanding women's struggle for emancipation at the same time, because he thought that the African-American struggle for emancipation had to be primary. I wrote, I wrote a long essay about Douglas not long ago, and it speaks to the, kind of the, you know, the questions of historical evaluation that you're, you're raising correctly. And in it, I said that the problem with trying to blame people in the past for the things that they did wrong isn't that we're being unfair to them. It's that we're not being sufficiently charitable to ourselves. Because the one thing we can say for certain is that future generations will look back on us and say, how could they have believed the things that they believed? How could they have imagined themselves to be good people and still slaughtered veal calves or engaged in ocean fishing or not acted sufficiently about a global warming? We, the one thing we know for certain is that we are guilty of sins that the future will see clearly that we can't see now. And that's why I try to be broadly uh, compassionate and charitable to all of those figures from the past. A major theme in your talk is the idea of patience, slowness, incremental, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems to me that one of the obstacles to the vision you're articulating is an environment, technological environment, where it seems to me we live in an age that's increasingly impatient, mm 
where it changes every year, every decade, not just every 30 years, a generation, then another generation. What, what are your thoughts about that? Because that, that, that seems to me a major challenge to liberal democracy that has nothing to do with who's elected president. Terrific question. Let me try and address that in two ways, uh, two things to say. First of all, and it's something that I've been out on the road, I'm kind of the Willie Loman of middle brow literature. I'm in one stop after another giving this uh, some version of, of this talk. And one of the things that I've learned in the course of doing that now for uh, a few weeks is that that I haven't explained. I was going to say there's some confusion about what I mean by incrementalism, but that's my fault. Not the, it's the fault of the speaker, not of the listeners. When I praise incrementalism, a thousand small sanities, slow change, I don't think that that's a virtue in and of itself. I think that's a reality that we can't avoid. There's all kinds of social change that I would like to see happen overnight. Uh, any of you who have read my writing in The New Yorker over the past few years will know that I am obsessive on the question of gun control and gun sanity, and nothing would make me happier in the world than for tomorrow morning for us to have gun laws in the United States, like the gun laws in, my, in Canada, or the gun laws in, uh, in Australia, or Great Britain. I would like those changes to happen right away. I don't think there's some inherent virtue in incrementalism. What I know is that when we live in a broadly plural society where we're appropriately compelled to respect the opinions of other people, that, it's, that making that kind of overnight change is extremely difficult and essentially impossible unless we're prepared to repress or persecute or imprison those who don't agree with us. And that's where incrementalism gets its energy and its edge, not because it's a good thing in itself, but because it's a necessary feature of living in a pluralist society. Your second question, uh, do we, does technology now so interrupted and fragmented our attention, our capacity for civilized discourse, our, our ability to engage in public debate, that the vision I'm offering is antiquated, the vision I'm offering of free debate, slow processes of reform and so on, is it, is it antiquated? I, I'm not a prophet, and I don't even pretend to be particularly prescient or far-seeing. I don't know. My sense is, and this is maybe my own uh, prejudice, but I think that I have some reason to believe it's true, is that uh, technology is, tends to be neutral. In other words, the problems we're looking at today, if you look back 50 years, you'll see people are saying exactly the same things. Is it possible to have liberal democracy go on in the face of television? This is a time when there were three channels in Philadelphia, as I remember well, and five on UHF, you could barely see. People were asking the same question. They, had asking, they were saying the same thing. And if you go back another 30 or 40 years to the time of the rise of fascism in, uh, in Europe. People said without uh, motion pictures, Hitler could never have come to power. It's the hypnotic power of the movies and newsreels that enables him to short circuit uh, rational debate. Now we look at those newsreels and movies and they seem to us creaky and in themselves antiquated. So I tend to think that we're at any moment in modern history, we're always inclined to blame technology for problems that are simple and permanent. Uh, part of it. And I don't see, when I look around the world, a shortage of good argument. I see a shortage of the right people winning the argument. And that's what this book is designed to, to do, inspire you to go out and make the right arguments, and maybe we can win some. But if I were Olivia, I'd be saying, yeah, Dad, but these guys are playing on hate. They're playing on fear. And it's so much more malleable. It appeals to the imagination in a way that, well, particularly fear does, in a way that your logical, reasonable, process-oriented doesn't. What do I do next? What do you do, say next? Olivia is a little bit younger than you are, but she said exactly that. <laughs> Has said that to me. That's a debate, a colloquy we have all the time. It's a terrific place to end, I think, tonight, because it addresses the, the central questions. Um, fear, the appeal of a tribal society, the appeal of tribalism, the appeal of, of closed societies, the appeal of the irrational, those aren't things that just rise now. Those are specters and, and traps that come up again and again and again in human history. And at any moment in modern history, certainly, the values that I've been advocating for tonight, the people who I've been talking about, always seem 
terribly weak. They're the wishy-washy ones. They're the overly rational ones. They're the ones who aren't going to win the argument. Every one of the, the people who I've been on our ride about tonight faced obstacles and enemies every bit as filled with hatred, every bit as skilled in manipulating fear as any that we have with us today. And at every moment in modern history, there's been a consensus that the values of liberal democracy were not strong enough to sustain the attacks of fascism in the 1930s or communism. It's why so many great intellectuals throughout Europe turned to fascism and communism in the 1930s because they said, oh, liberal, democratic, republican values just aren't strong enough. At the height of the Cold War, which I am, whose end I am certainly, end period, in the early 60s, I am old enough to remember when here in Philadelphia public school we had to go down into the basement and pull down black shades because the Russians would be bombing us shortly and if they saw a little sliver of light from the H.C. Lee School on 47th and Locust, we were doomed. <laughs> I remember that and people said at the height of the Cold War, the Russians have it all over us, the Soviets, they're organized, they're disciplined, they're authoritarian and we're weak and wishy-washy and we're fight with each other all the time and we live within contradictions. Liberal democracy can never struggle with a force like totalitarian communism. It turned out to be exactly the opposite, that exactly in our wishy-washiness, in our habit of debate, and our ability to promote new kinds of culture and new kinds of music, we turned out to be much stronger. I take it right up to the last decade. I was downtown on 9-11. I was reporting for the New Yorker when those uh, towers were, the second tower was hit. I had gotten the call, you should go downtown. I was there and I was watching. And everyone said in those horrible days and months and indeed years afterwards, there's no way that liberal democratic values can sufficiently counter the organized ideological fanaticism of uh, militant Islamism or of terrorism. We're really victimized by it. We're not strong enough, we're not disciplined enough, we're not regimented enough. And that turned out not to be true. Once again, liberal democratic values sustained themselves, liberal democratic values continued to propagate themselves and liberal democratic values continued to be more powerful, more seductive around the world than any others. At any moment in history, liberal democratic values will seem incredibly weak and history so far, I emphasize, I italicize, I put caps on so far, has shown that they can survive. Thank you so much for coming. I'd love to sign some books.